Last week, I started a series entitled Back to Basics, and we talked about communion. I preached on communion, the Lord's Supper, and I felt that God told me to preach on prayer this morning. And uh, <clears throat> I want to I want to say a couple of things. How you doing? It was so good seeing you doing worship with your hand up like that. That is wonderful. Good girl. You keep progressing, getting stronger, doing more things. You're healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. Yes. Praise God. We're not going to keep seeing you in that chair. We're going to see you run around. Totally healed, totally transformed. Amen. Can I get an agreement? Amen. Nod with me. Nod. Yeah, good girl. <laughs> All right. All right. So I started a new series entitled Back to Basics. And last week, God had me preach on communion. Very, very important thing. I wrote something down. We're going to put it up on the screen. And I want to read this from the get-go just to set the tone for today. Perspective is really important because it helps us to focus on what really matters. Repeat that after me. Perspective is really important. Now turn to somebody and say the next bit because it helps us to focus on what really matters. So last week I preached on communion which is the Lord's Supper. This week I'm preaching on prayer, and the irony is that prayer is all about communion, as in communication with God. But you can't have effective communication with God until we understand what the focus is of the communion that we take with God. Last year, last week, we took communion. Last week, I preached on communion. But communion is just another way of communing with God. Prayer is another way of communing with God. And what I'm saying here this morning is that the irony, while God had me preach on communion, the Lord's Supper, last week, this week, he's got me preaching on prayer, which is all about communion or communication with the Father. You cannot have effective communication with God. You cannot have an effective prayer life until you really understand communion, the Lord's Supper. Last week, when I was talking about the Lord's Supper, uh, there were two things that I mentioned. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And I made a point of saying, well, what is it that we want to or he wants us to remember? And I illustrated or pointed out two things in particular that we need to be mindful of when we take communion. Two things that it's important to remember. Number one, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. How many of you could agree that it's a very important thing to remember Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? What does that really mean? As I preached last week, it means that he died for us. Uh, what it means is you can't get away from the fact that God loves the world so much that he became one of us so that we could become one with him. Amen. God loves the world so much that he became one of us so that we could become one with him. That was the whole purpose of the crucifixion. That was the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth. God became one of us, identified with us, went through all the garbage that you and I go through so that in the end of him being here and dying on the cross, we become one with him. God wants that kind of connection. God wants that kind of unity. God wants that kind of fellowship. And the emphasis isn't on the doing. The emphasis is on what he has done. 
because he has made us sons and daughters of his, when we tap into the spirit, we have access to being in harmony with his thoughts and in harmony with his will. When we live by the spirit, it is a very, very powerful thing. Can I get an agreement? Amen. The second thing that we need to remember is what he did for us. And what that means is he died for us to redeem us back into relationship with the Father. So that for the rest of our lives here on earth, we can live as if we were never separated from him in the first place. I think it's really important. I've stressed this before. So many times uh, the church gets caught up in preaching the gospel of salvation. And in the gospel of salvation, I am a sinner saved by grace. But in the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of God, it's a bigger picture. In the gospel of the kingdom, the concept is that God didn't just come to save me from my hiccup and he's going to fix me up. In the gospel of the kingdom, God is restoring everything that went wrong from the beginning. You see, I'm not a mistake that God is fixing up. I am being brought back to my eternal destiny that God planned before the foundation of the world. Can I get an agreement? You see, too often, yeah, we live in a shadow of the blunder of humanity. We live in the shadow of the fact that we were broken. I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I was never meant to be a sinner. God's purpose and destiny for each and every one of us was that we would be glorious, magnificent, incredible specimens that replicate his image here on earth. And so our salvation is not a fix-up of what went wrong. Our salvation is a restoration of what was always meant to be. Yeah, I love it. Jesus said when uh, he broke bread with his disciples and told them to take communion, he said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. I have a phrase that I wrote. We're going to put it on the screen. The remember me of the Lord's Supper is so that in our minds we get Jesus back into the right perspective of relationship with the Father, which is he's God. So that we can get ourselves back into right relationship with God, which is he is our Father. You see, he doesn't just want to be the God of the universe, the supreme being who created everything from the beginning. He's not just deity, he's relational. He's become our father. You see, the Hebrew people knew God as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But what's interesting is in those titles, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of uh, Jacob is that he's the God of another and I happen to be of that race or nationality but what Jesus Christ came to restore to us is the God of personal relationship he is the God who is our father can I get an agreement God became flesh he became one of us so that he could we could become one with him the way it was always meant to be Is it? A buddy here said crystal clear. How many of you can see that crystal clear? Yeah. All right. There we go. The remember me of the Lord's Supper so that in our minds we get Jesus back into right perspective. Who is he? He's God in the flesh. So that we can get ourselves back into right relation with God, which is, he is our father. What's interesting about all of this is that the Lord's Supper prepares us for the Lord's Prayer. 
Last week, I preached on the Lord's Supper. I didn't know I was going to preach on the Lord's Prayer this week. I am not following a series that somebody else wrote. Every week, I walk by faith, and I never know what's going to come out the following week. And so come Friday and Saturday, I'm hanging on to uh, the Holy Ghost and saying, okay, what's next? What's next? All right? This isn't coming out of a book of sermons. This is coming out of what the Holy Spirit lays down week by week. The Lord's Supper prepares us for the Lord's Prayer because it starts with the focus on our Father. Communion focuses us on the fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and he came to restore relationship with us so that he's not the God of Abraham, he's not the God of Isaac, he's not the God of Jacob, he's not the God of my neighbor. He becomes my God, but more than just my God, he becomes my dad. He's my father. The Lord's Prayer. I said I was going to preach on prayer this morning. The Lord's Prayer is only found in two Gospels. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew from chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. And it's found in the Gospel of Luke from verse 2 to verse 4. Both Gospels start this prayer with our Father. And it's very important because <clears throat> the focus always has to start with the fact that God is our Father. Both start with our Father. I said that. I want to show you something. How did this topic come up? How did it come about that Jesus started to teach his disciples to pray? In Luke chapter 11, verse 1 we read and it says, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that when he stopped, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. I want you to get into the, uh, the mood of what was happening here. Here the disciples are watching this man from Galilee teach with authority like no one ever taught before. He had such sharpness, such clarity. Everything that he said made sense, and it had purpose. On top of that, he spoke with authority. Even demons had to obey him and were subject to his words. And beyond that, the natural realm that was broken, when he would put his hand and touch people or just speak a word, the natural realm of brokenness, the natural realm of infirmity had to submit to his power and to his authority and healing was released in people's lives. Amen. So here's the disciples, they're watching Jesus pray. He finally stops praying and they said, teach us how to pray. Now, the reason why that's very important is because these are Hebrew guys. By the age of 12, they are uh, uh, <clears throat> full-fledged. Uh, they know the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. They have to, by the age of 12, have memorized every scripture. How many of you know the first five books of the Bible by heart, verbatim? How many of you know the the names of the first five books of the Bible. We might even struggle with that. You see, we have to appreciate Jesus is talking to Hebrew men. The ways of their faith were deeply ingrained in them. The principles of prayer were taught them. They knew how to pray. But they're looking at Jesus and they're seeing the power of his life and they're saying, we want to know how to pray like that. We've prayed, but we've never gotten results like you get results. Jesus, show us the key. Show us what's different. Show us how to pray because we want to touch the type of power that you touched. Let me ask you here this morning, how many of you 
want to have a prayer life that you know you are in direct connection with God and when you pray, things happen in your life. I mean, honestly, who wants a prayer life that's hit and miss? I pray and sometimes it happens and sometimes, well, I'm still waiting. Jesus had a prayer life and it was never hit or miss. It was always on target. Would you agree with that? So they see him praying and they said, teach us how to pray. They understood that Jesus' prayer life was the reason he had a powerful life. Oh, that was good. Is it on the screen? They understood that Jesus' prayer life was the reason why he had a powerful life. I want a powerful life in Christ. I want to show you something really amazing about having a powerful prayer in life. Are you ready for this, Isaac? In Mark chapter 11... It's one of Jesus' most powerful teachings on prayer. In Mark 11, he's having a, a, a journey. He's going from Lazarus' house, Bethany, and he's going back to Jerusalem. And as he's going back to Jerusalem, he passes a fig tree that the day before... Now, this isn't a little fig plant. It's a fig tree. And Jesus cursed the fig tree the day before... And here they are, 24 hours later, the thing is dead from the roots up. And the disciples are absolutely amazed. How many of you would agree with me that a fig tree, even if it was only eight feet tall, for that thing to be dried up and dead from the roots up 24 hours later, how many of you would agree with me that whoever prayed that prayer has the ability to change circumstances? I want to be able to change circumstances like that. I want to be able to speak to my obstacles. I want to be able to speak to the things that oppose me, the things that harass me, and I want to have that kind of power with God. And it's out of this, the disciples seeing things like this, that they're hearing Jesus pray and they're saying, teach us how to pray. We want to tap into what you have tapped into. So he starts to outlay and unload and download the Lord's Prayer. But just before we go to the Lord's Prayer, Jesus in Mark 11 talks about prayer and he's teaching. And it's, like I said, probably one of the most powerful things. He releases the principles of prayer. And uh, <clears throat> Mark 11 verse 22 starts with two subjects. The primary subject is God, and the secondary subject is a mountain. Jesus says, have faith in God. If you have faith in God, you can speak to this mountain. Why is he saying that? The disciples are amazed that this fig tree just died from the ground up. Jesus, in explanation, says, listen, guys, the key to what you saw me do is this. Have faith in God. I tell you, anyone who has faith in God can speak to the mountain and the mountain will be removed. Two subjects, God and the mountain. But what's important is Jesus makes the primary subject God and the secondary subject the mountain. When we get into a crisis, when we're in a foxhole, when we're in a jam, when our back is to the wall, what we see is the conflict and the crisis. And what Jesus is saying is the key to powerful praying is to start your focus on God because when God is your focus, your perspective will fall into place with what God sees. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm trying. I, I only just started, you know. I've been just practicing a couple of months. I'm trying to get there. They understood that Jesus' prayer life was the reason he had a powerful life. What was it about how he prayed? Mark eleven twenty two. 22. 
He's having this discourse. And he's saying, guys, there will be circumstances that need to be altered. And you will have power like I have power. The same way I curse that fig tree from the roots up. I'm telling you that if your primary focus is God, if your focus is on God, perspective is everything. If your focus is on God and the mountain becomes secondary, you will be able to say to the mountain, be removed, and the mountain in your life will be removed. We're going to put this on the screen. When your perspective, sorry, when your perspective is right, your focus will be right. When your perspective is right, your focus will be right. Mark eleven twenty two, he says, have faith in God. The key to a powerful prayer life is that the focus is always on God. Everyone repeat after me. The key, the key. to a powerful life is that the focus needs to always be on God. When your focus is on God, you'll see the mountain in the right perspective. Because when your focus is on God, you'll see the mountain through God's perspective. I'm going to say that again. When the focus, when your focus is on God, you'll see the mountain, the problems, in its right perspective. Because when your focus is on God, you'll see the mountain through God's perspectives. Here, let me give you an illustration from the Bible. When God called Israel, or the Hebrew children, out of Egypt, he was taking them to the promised land. And as he was taking them to the promised land, they're right on the border of the land that is part of their promise. And uh, Moses picks a representative from the 12 tribes, one man to represent all 12 tribes. tribes. And two of those spies were Joshua and Caleb. Now, Caleb was an old geezer. The Bible says he was 80 years old. But when Caleb had opportunity, when they got into the promised land, he said, Moses, I want the mountain. I want the biggest, baddest obstacle, me and my tribe, we're going to conquer that mountain, we're going to subdue that mountain, we're going to live in that mountain, and we're going to make a living out of that mountain. That shows you a little bit the profile of what he, he was like as a person. His focus was on God, and because God was his focus, the mountain was something that was easy for him to conquer, even at the age of 80. The two spies out of the 12 that really stood out were Joshua and Caleb. Joshua is the young man who ends up leading the nation of Israel after Moses goes to be with God. Now, they send out the 12 tribes and Joshua and Caleb come back and they said Moses the land is filled with milk and honey fruit it is a fertile land the other 10 guys came back and they said the land is filled with giants Joshua and Caleb had a focus on the fact that they were God's chosen people their focus was God. They didn't see the giants. They saw the promise. The other ten men did not have a focus on who God is. They had a focus on who their enemy is. And so many times in life we are undone because our focus is on the problem rather than our focus being on God. While ever your focus is on the pro problem, your problem has just become the dominating force in your mind. Every time we pray, so often we pray from a place of conf uh, conflict or we pray from a place of crisis and our focus is on the problem. Listen to this. When you're praying to God, listen, this is good. 
When you're praying to God, you're in dialogue with the creator of the universe, and your primary focus is the crisis or the problem, you just made the problem a bigger God than the one you're talking to. Here are these 12 disciples. They were steeped in the Hebrew faith. They knew half of their Bible literally verbatim. And yet they saw a power in Jesus' life that was second to none. No wonder they said, teach us how to pray. We want to tap into what you've tapped into. And so before I even get to the Lord's Prayer, we see in an instance in Mark 11, Jesus is giving them a bit of a teaching on prayer. And he says, the reason why I can change the circumstance, I can speak to a fig tree and curse it and it will die from the roots. How many of you want your problems to disappear from the roots up? Now put your hand down and let me just put one note of caution. Don't let your problem be another person. Because God's not about eliminating people. But he's about eliminating the conflict. Hello? And Jesus says to them, guys, in a scenario where you're facing a mountain, we're in a scenario where your back is to the wall, when you're in the foxhole, when you're in the middle of a crisis, the problem is that humans see the problem from the perspective of the problem. If you're going to be in dialogue with me and the problem is your primary focus, you've made your problem bigger than me in your eyes. So let's go back to the 12 spies. 10 said, the land is filled with giants. And in our eyes, we were as grasshoppers before them. When the primary focus becomes the problem, your perspective is askew and God will never fit into the scenario. But when God is your primary focus, the perspective is right and your problem will no longer fit into your scenario. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering if, if you agree. When your focus is on God, you'll see the mountain in the right perspective because when your focus is on God, you'll see the mountain through God's perspective. You know what mountains are to God? The God who created the galaxies, the God who is still expanding the universe. Science is just realizing that the universe is still expanding. Do you know that the Bible prophesies and says that the heavens are expanding? The God who created the ever-expanding universe sees your mountain as nothing more than a stepping stone. Let me rephrase that. He sees it as nothing more than a pebble. And so when our focus is on God, we will see our mountains and we will see our problems through God's perspective. That's why when Jesus started teaching the Lord's Prayer, he starts with our Father. Our Father. The focus is on God and relationship with God. Jesus said in Mark 11, verse 22, have faith in God and the mountain will disappear. You have two subjects in that verse, it's so easily for the focus to be on the mountain. But when your focus is on the mountain, God disappears. And when your focus is on God, the mountain will disappear. It's very important that when we're praying, we start with our Father. You see, the Lord's Prayer is about perspective. Over the next couple of weeks as I teach on the Lord's Prayer, everything that Jesus says is bringing things back into perspective. He's giving us a God perspective all through the Lord's Prayer. 
But we tend to pray out of our human frailty, and we tend to pray out of our insecurity, our inferiority, and out of every one of our fears. Jesus said the key to power in prayer is that your focus starts with God. That's what he said in Mark 11. Have faith in God, and the mountain will disappear. When he taught them the Lord's Prayer, he starts with our Father. Everybody say, our Father. Okay. <laughs> I put my notes down and forget where I put them. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says, our Father in heaven. The first perspective is that he's our Father. I want to show you something really cool. It's something that normally you wouldn't pick up. Most people wouldn't pick up. In fact, <laughs> a lot of preachers haven't picked up, and I haven't picked it up. I've been preaching for over 40 years, but yesterday, God brought this to my attention. Are you ready for something uniquely new? How many of you are ready for something uniquely new? I never saw this in my entire life. So I'm studying last night, and God says, Look up the Greek word for hour. Look up for the Greek word for hour. Hours. Hours means it's yours, it's mine, it's ours. <laughs> what else is going to be behind the word hour? It's your father, my father, it's our father. But when you go to the Greek dictionary that lists all of these words verse by verse, the word hour is the word egg o, not ego, the emphasis on the o, egg o, and it is only ever expressed in an emphatic situation. So, in other words, when Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, he didn't say, Okay, boys, this is what you do. You let your voice drop and get deep, you get really serious. Speak loud and project your voice so everyone hears you. Stand as tall as you can so that everyone will notice you and you got their attention. No. He says, guys, when you pray, you start with our Father, and he uses the word ego, which means he emphasized. When you pray, the key to being focused is understanding God is your daddy. God is your father. He's not just the God of Abraham. He's not just the God of Isaac. And he's not just the God of Jacob. All of Israel, all of the Hebrew people knew God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was the old covenant. The Old Testament comes to show us how much we have fallen short of God's standard. The new covenant comes to show us how much God loves us so that he could bring us closer to him and we become one with him. Amen. While in the Old Testament, occasionally God is referred to as the God of Israel, the God of a nation, or the Father, sorry, the Father of Israel, the Father of a nation, Jesus starts by teaching us how to pray and the focus is on our Father. He is my daddy. Ego, the emphasis is he is my dad. He is my dad. He is powerful. He is in relationship with me. This is the dad who gave birth to me. This is the guy who thought about having me as a son one day. This is the dad who transposed his DNA into me and made me and I am part of him and he is part of me. Jesus said, when you pray, your focus needs to be on the fact you're in a relationship with the God who created the universe. They said, teach us how to pray, so we pray with power. Jesus didn't say, okay, say, Elohim, Jehovah, Shammah, the Lord who is present. He said, no. 
You want to know how to pray with power? You're asking me how to pray. You see the amazing things that I do? He said, I want you to understand that the key to power is your prayer life, and the key to a powerful prayer life is what you focus on. God isn't just the God who created the universe. He's our father. He's our daddy. He's our hero. He's our deliverer. He's the one who birthed us, and he's the one that made us like himself. Come on, give the Lord a praise offering. You see, this is an Abba Father moment. It's a daddy, daddy moment. Abba Father is the Greek way of saying daddy, daddy. And Jesus is saying, guys, come on, get rid of all of your Hebrew religion and all of the stuffiness. God isn't the God of a second generation or third generation. He's the God of first generation. He doesn't want to have a relationship with you through your great-great-granddaddy. He wants to have a relationship first-hand with you. He's your daddy. I love it. In Romans chapter 8, verse 6 to 15, the apostle Paul uses this term, Abba, Father. And he says, the spirit you receive doesn't make you a slave so that you're in fear again. So often, we live in our Christianity under the shadow of all the mistakes we've made in the past. And so Christians will say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, I am not a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner. I am saved by grace. And today, I am a son of God. The fact that we can say, Abba, Father, the spirit that God gave us is the spirit that urges us to call him Daddy, Daddy, Abba, Father, because he didn't give us a spirit that brings us back to remember all of our failures and all of our mistakes. He gave us a spirit that takes us into sonship and adoption so that we can say, Abba, Father. Let's read it. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. The power of a powerful prayer life is the focus on the fact that you have relationship with the creator of the universe, and you don't just have relationship with him, you have a father-son relationship, a father-daughter relationship. Now let me pause here, and let me quickly say, the devil understood the power of imagery, and he understood that if we got the revelation that we're created in the image of God, what you see, you become. What you behold, you fulfill. And so the enemy worked very hard on wrecking relationships between fathers and son and fathers and daughters. That's why at the very last book of the Old Testament, there's 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and New Testament. And God's closing words in the book, in the Old Testament, the last book, the last chapter, the last few verses of the Old Testament, God says this, in the last days I will restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the father, otherwise I will strike the earth with a curse. God is saying the thing that the enemy has done to manipulate, to wreck, to bring destruction to a God image daddy relationship is that he's gone around messing up human father, son, father, daughter relationships. And God says, I want to restore that. Amen. Closing words of the Old Testament and then the opening words of the New Testament, you have the genealogy of Jesus Christ and an angel coming to Mary and saying, his name will be Emmanuel, God 
with us. The disciples ask him how to pray, and the first thing he does is he focuses on our Father. He says, when you pray, say, our Father, Daddy, Daddy. The Apostle Paul says, he backs this up. He says, the spirit you received when you got born again isn't a spirit that brings you back to condemnation. How many of you ever struggled with condemnation? How many of you have ever heard the devil tell you you're not good enough? How many of you have ever sat here, the enemy reminds you of your past? Hey, God hasn't brought us the spirit of condemnation. He brought us the spirit of sonship. Turn to somebody and say, I am so glad. I'm not living in the past. I'm living in what Jesus did for me. Praise God. The spirit you receive does not make you a slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we call or cry, Abba, Father. It literally means Daddy, Daddy. You see, God wants you to understand that the power of your position is that you're a little kid and he wants to be the dad that is bigger than your imagination. Every little boy thinks his dad is a superhero until he grows up and realizes dad is just like him. But every little boy thinks his dad is a superhero. Jesus said we've got to come to God like little kids and get that image that he really is our superhero. He is the God who can turn our circumstances around. He's the God who can do the impossible. He's the God who can rectify the wrongs and make everything right. Come on, if you believe it, give God some praise. Amen. Jesus starts his topic on prayer and he says, your focus, you got to have the right perspective. Your focus has got to be on God. And when your focus is on God, you will see your mountains through God's perspective. And they are nothing more than stepping stones to God's next promise. Amen. 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 Every, turn to somebody and repeat after me. Turn to someone and say, every problem in my life, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name is a stepping stone, stepping stone to my promises. my promises. I will receive, I will receive the, promise of God the promise of God in my life, in my life and, over my life. and over my life. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. I'm going to ask you a question. You see, it's easy to get up and lecture and to tell people what they should do. And here's Jesus telling his disciples how to pray. And here's a question. How would Jesus pray when he's facing a crisis? He told the disciples, have faith in God and speak to the mountain. We talk about the mountain. Did you ever notice that when you talk about the mountain, the mountain gets bigger and bigger and bigger? When you put your focus on God, and God is the primary subject, the mountain gets smaller and smaller and smaller. I want you to understand this dynamics. It's a very powerful thing, not just psychologically, spiritually. Because when you talk to God and your focus is the problem, you've just made a problem a bigger God than who God is. This is very important spiritually, theologically. It's not just a psychological issue. It's not a matter of mind over matter. It's a matter of getting God's perspective over the situation. <clears throat> and so when we focus on God, we will see the mountain through, the, through God's perspective, and it's a stepping stone to our promise. So here's the issue. Jesus is teaching them how to pray, and he's saying all of these things. Have faith in God. Speak to the mountain. 
Don't get absorbed with the mountain. Don't talk about the mountain. Don't vilify the mountain. Don't talk about how bad the mountain is. We talk about how bad the devil is and we make him bigger and bigger and bigger. And every time we talk about what the devil's doing, it's like blowing into a balloon and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Jesus said, focus on the Father and focus on the fact that he is your Father. And when you focus on the fact that you have this dynamic father-son relationship, your prayer life will take, great, take on great power because now you've got God's focus and you've got God's mind on the matter of things. So how does Jesus pray when he's facing a mountain? We have an example here in scripture, and I'm going to close this morning with this here. It's my final point. Jesus faced the biggest mountain of his life. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, less than 24 hours away from being handed over to the Roman government. He wasn't just being handed over to a few Roman soldiers. He was being handed over to the Roman Empire. It was the biggest, the fiercest, the, the most destructive empire that had ruled the world to that point. They were like iron. They just crushed anything that stood in their way. Jesus was about to be handed over to the Roman Empire. He's about to be nailed to a Roman cross, crucified, and die one of the most inhumane methods of dying. You know, it's not the nails in your hand that kill you, nor is it the nails in your feet, nor is it the 39 lashes on your back that kills you. What kills you is the fact that in the position that you're placed on a cross, you literally are gasping for air and you die of a lack of oxygen because in that position you cannot breathe in and take in oxygen the way God designed you to. So it's a very slow and agonizing death. To speed up the process, that's why the Roman centurions would take the back edge of the sword, a quarter inch thick of hardened steel, and they'd come along and break the shin bones of the person on the cross so that they could not lift themselves up to grab air. And now everything is just hanging there on the cross and they slowly die of suffocation. One of the most inhumane methods of execution. And here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane knowing full well what's about to happen. How does Jesus pray when he's facing the biggest traumatic moment of his life? Because in all honesty, for everything that Jesus went through, he never went through anything as de potentially decimating as his crucifixion on the cross. And we have a record of how he prayed in that moment. And Mark writes it in his gospel. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. He's sweating drops of water, sweat, and he's sweating drops of blood. Biologically, he is already breaking down. His constitution is breaking down. And he's sweating blood. And he says in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will be done. Here's Jesus facing the biggest mountain of his life. Here's Jesus facing the most crushing potential opportunity, uh, situation in his life. And in the moment that he's in a foxhole, the moment his back is to the wall, in the moment where the whole world is about to come crushing down on him, how does he pray? He starts from the position of focusing on God and focusing on the fact this is his father. And he says, Abba, Father, Daddy, Daddy. Wow. This is a, the key or a key 
to a powerful prayer life. When you and I understand we're not just sinners saved by grace, we've been made sons. We've been made daughters. You have destiny. You have purpose. You're not a hiccup that God had to fix up. You are a person who was taken out of your destiny and Jesus Christ came to bring you back to your purpose before the foundation of the world. I'm not a mistake. I am God's purpose. You're not a mistake. You are God's purpose. God has a plan and a design for your life and it's not a plan for failure. It's a plan for success. Somebody, give the Lord a praise offering. The most powerful position you could take in prayer is to focus on the fact that he's not just the God of the universe. He's your personal dad. And as your dad, he will come to your rescue he will fight your bullies. He will turn your circumstance around. Listen, nobody has more favor than a father's son. And when you pray, you have the favor of a father's son. My closing statement, and we're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. When you start with our father or Abba father, the recognition that he is daddy, daddy, and that's the relationship he wants to have with you. Remember, this is Jesus. God in the flesh is saying, when you start your prayers, remember, I'm daddy. Remember that it, from my part, I'm the one who wants to treat you like his little son. I'm the one who wants to be a father to you. When you start with our father or Abba father, Daddy, daddy, your mountains will fall into the right perspective because your focus is on God and not on the problem. Come on, let's stand. Come on, stand with me. Thank you, Jesus. Devil, you're a liar. Come on, say that. Devil, you're a liar. You're not going to push me around saying. I was a nobody. God made me a somebody. I was a failure. God brought me back on point. I'm not a mistake that needs a fix up. I'm a vision and a dream that God had before the foundations of the world. My rightful, place My rightful place before Adam ever fell, Adam ever fell was, to be a son of God. was to be a son of God. And I'm back on target. And I'm back on target. Amen. Amen. When we pray from that perspective, now you're not praying from a place of hopelessness. You're praying from a place of hope. When we pray from that perspective, now you're not just crying out to an impersonal deity, even if he's the creator of the universe. Now it's relationship. You're crying out to someone who is personally invested in you. You can't have a biological father without having his DNA inside you. In other words, he's in you. And Jesus brings to our attention that the most powerful place to start in prayer is to start from the focus that when you cry out to this deity who's created this ever-expanding universe, you're talking to a person who's so invested in you that he made you in his image and he put his DNA inside of you. And even though a thief came and stole you and kidnapped you and took you away, he personally came to earth as a man, allowed his body to be torn apart, and he paid the price for your rescue. 
You won't get more relationship than that. This isn't the daddy who wants to kick you out of the house. This is the daddy who will fight to the death mm -hmm. to bring you back yes. to the house. Yes. If my relationship with him was based on my performance, every day I would create reasons for being excluded. But my relationship with him is based on his good pleasure to be my dad and to be your dad. He doesn't look for the ways to see how we deserve him. He just looks for the ways and how many ways he could count for just loving us. No reason necessary except that he is that good and he is that great. Amen. When we pray from the position of our Father, a go, emphasis, daddy. You pray from the most powerful position in the universe. Because there was one other time, the very beginning of the eons of time, that a son prayed. And that was when the word stood on the edge of creation. And everything that was in the father's heart the son spoke the first prayer and it was the prayer that gave birth to all of creation you and I today are the sons of God and we can pray Abba Daddy because of Jesus Christ God wants to be a dad a good dad, a loving dad. And irrespective of what you've experienced in life from an earthly father, this is the dad who checks every box and gets it perfectly right. He's good. You know, in the world we say bad to the bone. God is good to the bone. Everything about him ekes goodness, mercy, grace, love, understanding, and compassion. He is so good, the enemy is constantly trying to paint over the image of God and convince us that we're on God's hit list. He's out to get you. You know what? I'm on God's bless list. You're on God's blessed bless. Turn to someone and say, I'm on God's blessed list. He's out to bless me. Every time you pray, pray from the place of relationship. He's my daddy. He's my daddy. He's my daddy. My dad died at the age of 69. He died young. He wasn't a perfect man, but he was a good man. He was a man of integrity. He was an honest man. To have a relationship with him, we moved to Australia, and I had to learn Italian from the kids that had immigrated to Australia from Italy. And once I learned broken Italian, man, I didn't care how messed up my Italian was. Now I could talk with my dad. I used to talk to my dad through my mom. He would talk to her and she would translate to me. Now I had relationship because we had the same language even though mine was pretty messed up. My Italian's not as bad as my Spanish, but it's not great. <laughs> God made sure he understood our language. That's why the Bible says, that that Messiah 
the Christ would come and he would be rejected by men, despised by many. He would be broken and spat on. He's learned the language we live in this world. He's learned the language of our hearts. You ever see these nature programs where a baby seal is born and then mom goes out to sea and is gone for a week getting food, filling herself up with nourishment and the moment she steps back on shore, she only has to open her mouth once and make a sound and her pup knows her and she knows her pup. God knows your language and he knows your scent. And the moment you cry, Abba, Daddy, Daddy, he comes because he knows we are his own. Hallelujah. You can't start prayer from a more powerful place than from the place of a father, daughter, father, son relationship. If you've never asked Jesus Christ in your heart, the only way to make the God who created this amazing universe personal to you is to accept that he became a person and he died on the cross for you. Jesus didn't die for his sins or his mistakes. He died for my sins, my mistakes. He died for every mess up you and I have ever made. I'm going to ask everyone to close your eyes. If you're here this morning and you don't know God as your dad, if you don't know him in this personal, intimate way, you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, I want to tell you that is the beginning of reconnecting with your purpose in life. Finding your creator and coming back into relationship of father and child. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart and the spirit of God is urging you, pulling on you, tugging at you, while every eye is closed, come on, raise your hand right now and say, I want relationship with God. Raise your hand right now and say, I want relationship with this God. Thank you, Jesus. See that hand? Who else? Others want to say yes to Jesus? One or two raise their hands very subtly, but raise their hands. Come on, church, repeat after me. If you raised your hand, this is, you feel something tugging in your heart. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for becoming one of us. Jesus Christ, I believe you are God. And you died on that cross specifically for all the mistakes I made. You became the curse that I was so that I could be set free from the curse. Jesus Christ, I invite you to come into my life. I welcome you into my day-to-day -day experience. I'm asking you, Jesus, to live in me and to live through me. Talk to me. Walk with me. I want relationship just like you want relationship. And Father, I'm asking you today, because of Jesus Christ, forgive me of all my sins. And thank you for making me your child. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. If you are here for the first time today, I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you in the foyer. We have some uh, refreshments there. Give us an opportunity to say hello. But to the rest of the church, your family, 
We all came from the same broken place. And we've all been taken back to our rightful place. Turn around, give someone a high five. Come on, greet people. Before you just walk out of here, connect with people. Connect with other sons and daughters of God. Greet each other. Amen.